Cabarrus County, North Carolina, is the site of the Reed Gold Mine. And this is the place of the first documented gold find in the United States. But the gold wasn't found by a group of explorers looking for gold and looking to make it rich. However, it was found by a child, a boy, named Conrad Reed. Conrad was out playing in the field like boys do, and he ran across this rock that he just thought was kind of cool looking. It was neat. It was interesting. And so he took this rock back to the house and showed his dad, and his dad's like, well, now there's something, something different about this rock. So he took it into town, and he took it to a silversmith, and the silversmith looked at it quickly and kind of glanced and was like, it's an interesting rock, but that's exactly what it is, it's an interesting rock. And so they took it back to the house, and because it still was kind of neat looking, they uh, used it as a doorstop at their house. Now, they did this for years. This stone just sat there. And then just as a hunch, his dad was like, you know, I'm going into Fayetteville, North Carolina. It's a larger city. And I'm going to take this with me and have someone else look at it. So he went in and took it to a jeweler. And the jeweler takes the time to look at it with an expert's eye. And he looks at it from each angle, and he determines that this isn't just an interesting rock, but this is a 17-pound gold nugget. Now, that just went from a doorstop to what would be valued today as half a million dollars worth of gold. What once was just ignored as you walked into the house, now was what started the first actual gold rush in the United States. This morning, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Now, what I want you to remember as we go through this is that fundamental growth will lead to formative worship if it is on the foundation of of Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and grab your copy of God's word and let's open them up to 1 Peter chapter 2 and I'll begin reading at verse 1. So put away all malice, all deceit and hypocrisy, and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and offer to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. Let's pray and ask God to bless our time in his word this morning. Lord God, we just come before your throne this morning to worship you, to worship you in word, to learn more of you. Lord, we just pray that you give me the ability to say what needs to be said, that your children can hear a word from you, that we can learn more about you, Lord, that we can adore you through your word. Lord, that we can hear from you and we can respond to who you are and to what you say. Lord, we love you 
And this time is for you and for you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. As Peter starts in chapter 2 here, the first thing he says is, So put away. So put away malice and deceit and slander. Put this away. The, the word put away, that Greek word, can also be translated to take off. Just as you would take off clothing. As you would take off a jacket when you come inside uh, because it's warm on the inside but cold outdoors. The idea is this stuff can be taken off. A popular idea we have today in our society is I am the way I am, and so everybody else has to deal with it. There's no changing me. I am the way I am. I've seen uh, a lot of people take personality tests like the Enneagram, and, and they know their numbers or the DISC assessment uh, and, and various other ones that uh, will tell you a little bit about the way you are, about the way you think, and, um, and help you out that way. But I think there's a problem when we get to the point of using those uh, assessments of who we are to kind of cover up our bad conduct, to cover up our sins, because that's just the way we are. When we refuse to fellowship with our fellow believers, because, well, I'm an introvert, and, you know, it makes me nervous. I, I, I don't talk very well. And so I can't stay for fellowship and I can't fellowship with my other believers in a discipleship group because I'm an introvert. So I'm just going to stay over here and I'm going to show up and, and just sit in the back and you know, don't talk to anybody because that's just the way I am. That's, that's who I am. Or, you know, I took the assessment and I'm a, I'm a this on the Instagram and I'm, a, I'm an aggressive leader and, and I'm strong and, and uh, you know, I may come across a little bit harsh, but hey, you know, it's okay. I'm not really mean. Uh, I just come across that way. Uh, you're just going to have to accept it and just learn to live with me because that's the way I am. We make excuses for our poor conduct. We make excuses for our sins and say, well, that's just the way I am. Here, Peter's telling us, no, take that off. It is not who you are. It's what you do. You can take it off like you can change clothes. Get rid of those bad attitudes. Get rid of those sinful activities. They're holding you back. I tell you, Jesus accepts us exactly the way we are and where we are. However, I don't believe he expects us to stay there. Because what we hear now is Peter says, take this stuff off because he's about to tell us that this is going to hinder our spiritual growth. Think of it this way, a farmer, it's time to sow the seed. He does not just wake up one morning, grab a bucket of seed and walk out and just start spreading seed around. Instead, he goes out weeks prior and he goes out with his machines and he tills the land, bringing up the fresh soil from underneath and breaking it up so that it will receive the seed well. He adds to it fertilizers and other things that will help the plants to grow. That he'll have a great harvest in the fall. And then when he finds things in the soil that will hinder the growth of the plants, he takes that away. If he finds rocks, he throws those out because those will hinder the growth of his crop. If he finds plastics and trash and things that shouldn't be there that will hinder the growth of his crop, he removes it, he puts it away, he throws it away, he takes it off. And the same here, as Peter begins to tell us about how we spiritually grow, he's like, get rid of this stuff, it's only going to hold you back. But instead... He says, yearn for, desire the pure spiritual milk. Now, that term pure spiritual milk, is, it, it can also be mental milk. This is a mind thing. 
And it's also an a analogy that we see other ways in Scripture. But milk is for the youth. Today, milk is pasteurized. Today, it's kept in a fridge, and we can keep milk for a decently long time compared to days before fridges, days before we figured out pasteurization. And in these days, most of the time, if adults were going to consume a milk, it was going to be in some kind of dairy product because cheese, and the way they made it, lasts a lot longer than milk would. And milk, while it has a lot of nutrients and such, this is for infants. This is for young children that have no teeth or not able to chew and consume meat. But instead they take milk. It gives them the nutrients and they're able to consume the milk much easier than they would be able to consume a steak or you know, barbecue or something good like that. And then even in Hebrews chapter 5, we see this analogy again um, of the pure spiritual milk being consumed. And in uh, chapter 5, verse 13, he says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by con constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So we see that milk is good for us as we begin to grow, but there's also the concern that we don't need to continue on milk. When I was young, my testimony kind of starts around the age of 12. Before that, I was, um, my family and I were cultural Christians at best. We, I, t I attended Sunday school a couple times. I'd been to a church before. Um, my, if I stayed at my grandparents on Saturday night, then Sunday morning I'd go to church with them. But that was, that was it. And when I was 12, a friend of mine invited me to a church camp. I was like, oh, I can go camping for a week. Okay, let's do this. So I went to this church camp, and we had our activities during the week, and we had studies and talked about Jesus and the Bible and, and all of that. And when it came to the last night, we were there. They gathered the whole camp together, and we were sitting in this amphitheater. And um, on the stage at the bottom, the pastor was speaking. He had this huge cross, wooden cross behind him. And this was dusk. So the lights of the world were going dim. It was getting dark outside, and as he was closing up, some of the other uh, camp counselors came and lit road flares that were in the places where Jesus' hand and feet would have been. You know, road flare glows red, burns red, but it also drips almost like a candle, but a lot more. And as they're sideways on the cross, they're dripping this glowing red, what looks like blood. And you know, that, that image is still just burnt into my mind. But the Holy Spirit, I believe, was speaking to me at that time, was convicting me of my sins, and, and I was realizing through the word uh, that the preacher was, was preaching the gospel that Christ died for my sins so that I could be reconciled to a holy God. And I responded by just walking up at the end, talking to the pastor there, and he answered my questions and, and explained better, and, and we prayed the sinner's prayer and, and all of the things you're supposed to do. And next morning, we woke up, we all went to the pool, and all of us that, that responded the night before were baptized at the pool at the, church, at the uh, campground where we were. After that, we gathered all of our stuff, got on the buses, and headed home. And I never heard from that church again. 
that Sunday, I guarantee someone came up during the service and they were glorifying God and being like, this many people got saved at our church camp. This many people got baptized at our church camp. I wasn't there. I never heard from them. No one ever pulled me under their wing and said, hey, now that you're a Christian, this is what's supposed to happen. I didn't even know to desire the spiritual milk. I would now consider my teenage years as stunted growth, where I was born again, but I wasn't growing. Imagine if, we, if you see a 10-year-old boy, but he's in the body of a three-year-old. We would take that boy to the doctor and ask the doctor, what's wrong? Something is not right. What is it? And we'd have these questions rightfully. Then why was no one grabbing me and saying, this boy has been a believer for years and is still an infant. How many do we have like that? Peter's telling us, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We need to get together and disciple each other that we can grow, desire the spiritual milk, that we may grow up in our salvation. And work out our salvation. And then in verse 3, he starts with the word if. If it's a conditional statement. So what he's about to say is, if this that I'm about to say is true, then everything before this is also true for you. If what I'm about to say does not apply to you, ignore all of the previous. So, he says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you have tasted that the Lord is good, then desire and yearn for the pure spiritual milk. Grow spiritually. But you know what? If that's not true, if that's not you, you have not tasted that the Lord is good, you are not saved. Then trying to grow spiritually uh, is impossible it's a frustration for you to try to grow spiritually if you have not tasted that the lord is good and what he means by that you're not what we would say today saved so we see this fundamental growth that he's encouraging from us and what that's going to lead to now is formative worship he starts in verse 4 as you come to him, as you come to him, speaking of Jesus, of God, when do we come to Jesus? When do we come to God? We gather together, we, as a plural, gather together each week to come before the throne room to God together to worship him. So as we come together and worship, as we worship him, who he describes as a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, Chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So what he's saying is while we gather together and come before the Lord, it's during this time that we are being formed together as living stones into a house of God. So there's something that happens every Sunday morning when we gather together in this room. Something formative about our worship that is building us together into a household. Each one of us considered a living stone. You see, houses are not built of one stone. But many Stacked on top of each other, brick by brick by brick, mortared together for strength. All of these separate bricks come together to make one cohesive wall 
and a wall connects to a wall and makes a house that you can live in, that will keep you warm in the winter and, and cool in the summer, that will protect you from the elements, that will keep you safe from robbers and thieves. We come together to be a spiritual house in the same way. When we gather on Sunday morning, do not be confused. This is not a time for 100 individuals to gather in the same room to individually worship God. This is a time for the body of Christ to gather as one body, to come before God and worship him as one body. And during that time, we are formed together in our worship of him. He says we are built up as a spiritual house. We're going to be a holy priesthood. We're going to be a, we're going to offer our spiritual gifts to God. That are acceptable, it says they're acceptable to God. And while we have this time of formative worship, there's one clause I just left off. It's acceptable to God only if through Jesus Christ. Our spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we have fundamental growth which leads to our formative worship as we gather if it's based on the foundation of Jesus. So he continues and says, for it stands in Scripture. I tell you, if you're going to make an argument, that's a great way to start. Let more of our arguments be based on Scripture. And Peter points back to Scripture that he has at that time and he writes, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for those who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. You said earlier, he called Jesus a living stone rejected by men in the sight of, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. We're living stones, and Christ is a living stone. However, he is chosen and precious, rejected by men. During the Passion Week, Jesus was rejected by men. Pontius Pilate brought Jesus before the crowd. And he said, here, I have Jesus, King of the Jews. And on this side, Barabbas, a thief and a criminal. I will release one. Who do you want? The crowd rejects Jesus and takes a criminal and frees a criminal because Jesus was such an offensive person to them at the time. Not much has changed. The name Jesus is probably the most offensive name in the world today. Started reading a book couple of weeks ago. And the book's not even about spiritual matters. It's, it's more of a uh, time management kind of book, uh, leadership type book. Um, and I, I got it. Someone recommended it to me. And before I started reading, I, I went to look at some of the reviews of what people have said about this book. And one review popped out to me and it said, this book was deceptive. I'm like, whoa. That's a, that's a very odd review of a book. How is this book 
deceptive. And so as I read the rest of the review, they said, this is a book written for Christians. It's, it, it's full of Bible verses. And so after like the second Bible verse, I was done. I, I didn't even finish this book. And then what was worse was the comments underneath that was, oh, thanks for this review. I won't read it now. Not interested at all. And I was like, well, one, I didn't realize it was a Christian author when I picked out the book. So, hey, that's actually a plus for me. So I went ahead and read the book. However, I, I kept that in mind. And as I'm reading, I see on the title page in the beginning, before you even get to the, to the actual book, there's a scripture reference. Not the whole verse, just a scripture reference. And as I read through the book, now I can only think of twice that he quoted a pastor who actually was saying something about leadership and not anything about the Bible. And I thought, wow, this person got so bent out of shape, got so upset he had to write a review to tell everybody else not to, to read this book because it only had the reference to one scripture and he quoted two pastors that weren't even talking about the Bible at the time. But that was enough of Jesus to offend this person. Jesus is one of the most offensive names in the world today. He is still rejected by men. But in the sight of God, chosen and precious. And then the scripture before says he's, a, he's laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and, and precious. Now, cornerstones, that's a big deal in their time. Today, we don't use those anymore. With modern technologies of how we build, the cornerstone is not really necessary with our surveying equipment and such. But um, you know, you may see them some today. There, there are fancy buildings that they, they place a cornerstone in the corner of the building, more for decorative thing. They'll, they'll, they'll etch in there the year the building was made or a dedication the building's dedicated to or something like that. But in that day, the cornerstone was the most important stone in the entire building. All other stones would be laid and aligned to this cornerstone. Therefore, the cornerstone must be perfect. The cornerstone can have no flaws. You don't take your beginner stone builders and put them to work on the cornerstone. No, this is where you put the experts. And they make sure every corner is, is perfect. They make sure every side is planed smooth and level and that the sides are parallel to each other the stone is perfect because every other stone will be aligned to that cornerstone our cornerstone is perfect and we align ourselves as other living stones being built up into a house we align ourselves to jesus christ now the problem becomes when the stones start aligning themselves with the other stones around them. When we compare ourselves to the other stones around us, or when we take a preacher, put him on a pedestal, and be like, that's, that's what I need to be like. If I could be like him, and we start aligning ourselves to him, I tell you what, every preacher is not aligned perfectly to Jesus Christ. None of them are, and includes myself. So if you're already aligning yourself to a stone that's not aligned to the cornerstone precisely, you're intentionally disaligned from the cornerstone. When, in the, when I was in the Marine Corps, 20 years in the Marine Corps, I was artillery. So if you don't know what that is, it's really big guns that shoot really far. One of my jobs was survey. My, I would um, determine precise location of our guns and the targets. And then I would also set out a marked direction, a marked azimuth for all of the guns to align to. So they're all pointing exactly the same way. 
Now, I had an error of margin, a margin of error in that direction. And it was very precise. And we used a, 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 a measurement we call a mill. And this, it's like a degree, you know, 360 degrees in a circle. This is just uh, smaller. So a mill is defined as one meter at 1,000 meters away. So if I take a, a, a bar that's a meter long, and I place that 1,000 meters away from me. One mil is the, di the angle between one end and the other of that bar at 1,000 meters. But the farther you get from the source, the greater the error. If I then move that bar out to 2,000 meters, actually one mil is two meters long. If I go out 3,000 meters, that same angle is three meters long. That makes a difference when we're shooting uh, projectiles out to 30, 40,000 meters. So the further we were from the source, the greater the error. So we had to be aligned precisely at the source. And the same is true here. The further you get away from the source, the greater the error. We always look back. No matter what I say here, go back to Scripture and look at it. Align yourself to Him, not to anything I say, unless I am aligned to Him in what I say. We always go back to the cornerstone. Because to us, that is honor. We celebrate the cornerstone. We look at our perfect precise cornerstone and we celebrate that God has given us such perfection. And he says this in, in verse seven, so the honor is for you who believe, for us, it's a honor. But for those who do not believe, the stone that men rejected is now the cornerstone. It's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word. You know, that, that's kind of easy to get. The word of God teaches truth. If you disobey it, there's consequences. A, a very easy explanation of that is, is God's word teaches, do not murder. If you murder, there are consequences to that. Our society has built in consequences. If you murder, you're going to jail for a very long time. But honestly, that example falls wildly short of what we're talking about here. For example, John in his prelude calls Jesus Christ the Word of God. The Word of God said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will go to the Father except through me. So what's that saying is, he's saying if there is any other way you're trying to get to God, besides Jesus Christ, you're going to fail. If you're relying on your own good works, sorry, you fail. If you're relying on some other man throughout history who said that they're the way, then those men are all in the grave. Christ left an empty grave. If you try any other way, you're going to fail. You're not going to be reconciled to God. You will still be separated from the Holy creator of the universe. And when you die, that separation becomes permanent. We're dealing with eternity. Not a few years in prison, but eternity being separated from your creator. And that's a sad note to end on. But I believe when we come together 
in our time of worship and we open God's word. That that is our time to hear from God. And I believe that if someone comes up to you and starts talking to you and you do not respond in any way, shape, or form to them, that's rude. It's disrespectful. It's unkind. Arrogant. It's insulting. God, has, I believe, has spoke to us this morning through his word, as we look at it. How are we supposed to respond? First, if you fall into that category, the ones who do not believe, if you have not tasted and found out that he is good, then your response is to come to Christ to repent, to come to him because he is good and believe. And if that's you, find me. Find any leadership in this church. Find us. Search for the milk. We'd be glad to talk to you. We want to talk to you. We want to explain that. We want you to understand why Christ had to die on a cross for your sins so that you can now be reconciled to your holy creator. But you know what? There's the other side for the rest of us. You know Christ. You have tasted. He is good. What is your response this morning? Could it be that you have refused to take off those sinful ways? Malice, deceit, and slander, and, and others. And you've made excuses and say, that's what, that's just the way I am. Jesus accepts me as I am. Like I say, he doesn't want you to stay there. Maybe you need to confess that those have not been come off. Maybe you, you were like I was as a youth. Yeah, I know I'm saved, but now what? You're not in a discipleship group. You don't have a mentor to disciple you and to help you through learning and growing in your salvation. If you need to get connected and discipled, that's your response this morning. Come find us. Any leadership in the church, find us, and we will get you connected to a discipleship group if we need to, we'll get you a, a mentor that can sit with you on a regular basis and walk through the tenets of the faith so that you can really know that he is good. Maybe you are being discipled. But you come Sunday morning and it's a bore. You know, you, you walk in late. You know, because you're only there for the, really the sermon. None of this other sing-alongs beforehand are really worthwhile. I don't like to sing anyway, so. You know, and, and you just, there's nothing exciting about a gathered body. and You don't feel in place. I want to talk to you about that. Because we need to realize what we're doing here on Sunday morning is a time of gathered corporate worship as we participate together, it's not an audience and, a, and people on stage performing for you. It's all of us together worshiping God, bringing our spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to Him because they're through Jesus Christ. Maybe you feel like you're not aligned to the cornerstone. Maybe you can see that, you know what, I have been putting some of these other people in positions and aligning to them. Repent. And just pour it out to God. Lord, I'm sorry. He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Repent for that and 
put your eye on the cornerstone that you can see how perfect he is and align to him. And like I said, I, I think it's a time of response, a time that we should come together as a congregation, as a body of Christ, as a spiritual house, and respond to God because he has spoken to us this morning. Let us be doers of the word, not just hearers only, as we respond this morning.